Hi everyone, my name is Layla D. Heyman and I am the Director of School Climate for Albuquerque Public Schools. Hi, my name is Jeff Newcomer Miller and I am the Restorative Practice Coordinator for the Albuquerque Public School System. So today we're just gonna spend a little bit of time uh, going over restorative practices and some things that we've done in our district, um, in the schools that we work in. So just to talk a little bit about the school climate team, I thought it'd be important to um, introduce each one of our programs. So today what you'll hear us talking about mostly is restorative practices. Um, one of our other programs is the Behavior Redirector Program. What that is, is a K-5 inclusive program, and we provide supports to students who need behavior um, interventions in the classroom. And so we have a behavior redirector in all of our elementary schools. Uh, the next program is suicide prevention. Currently, we have a peer helpers program in 22 of our secondary schools. Next, we have crisis recovery. We oversee the DSMART team, which is the district stress management and recovery train team. They do all of our crisis recovery and that's overseen by Rachel Ochoa, who is our crisis resource counselor. And she also provides a uh, suicide consultation for any student in the district. Um, the counselors can call and get consultation um, through Rachel on the crisis recovery phone. We also oversee social emotional learning. So we provide SEL support um, through the counseling department and we have an ongoing collaboration with the SEL special education team in APS and that's to do any kind of training or technical assistance for any school that is interested. Our last program is bullying prevention. So we provide training to schools and to, to staff and students so that they could better understand what bullying is and what it is not. And then we also provide ongoing technical assistance to any school that wants to implement any kind of preventative programming. So this is our APS restorative justice policy, and it has uh, been in our student handbook for a number of years, uh, for the last couple of years. And it simply points out that the district itself is attempting, working towards more restorative uh, practices, restorative justice and practices. And so I wanna just read it really quickly, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what some of the things we're doing a little bit later. So it just states, restorative justice practices are based on respect, responsibility, relationship building, and relationship repairing. Restorative justice practices give priority to repairing harm done by individuals and school communities and provide student accountability by assuming responsibility and taking action to repair the harm they caused. It aims to keep students in school and to create a safe environment where learning can flourish. So this policy was originally introduced to the district in 2015, and this was really in response to um, our disproportional rates of suspension, especially for students of color and students with disabilities. And so as a district, we really wanted to start thinking through what our policies look like and then providing ongoing professional development and training for our staff to begin handling things in a more restorative manner at the school. So we are spending just a few moments to delineate, to, expre uh, to explain a little bit about what we mean by restorative practices. Typically, if you've heard of restorative practices, uh, you've mainly heard of the term restorative justice. And restorative practices, um, I would say, is a little bit of a newer term. Um, and tip in, in the beginning, in the impetus of restorative justice, it started really in the criminal justice system, working with particularly juvenile offenders. And this program was intended to um, simply have, stu have kids who had committed crimes make things right with the victims of their crime. Uh, in an effort to sort of curb uh, a lot of the recidivism that they were seeing, a lot of the um, habitual offenders um, and other problems. And so restorative justice uh, began initially in the 1970s. Um, it has practiced worldwide 
um, and mainly focuses within the criminal justice system or in communities. Restorative practices is really more of a newer uh, interpretation of restorative justice. And what it's done or restorative practices has done is taken a lot of the practices of restorative justice, which um, include um, uh, mediation, include circle process, uh, include one-on-one -on -one conversations, include some of the use of language um, and how we talk about instances, how we talk about offenders, how we talk about victims, um, and what does it mean to be a community member uh, or a party who is uh, affected by an incident. Um, and we took all those practices and we really wanted to start front-loading those, um, particularly the ones that were preventative, that built community, that helped um, establish a culture or a climate within a school, um, within any kind of uh, organization, so that when something did happen, because we know um, with whatever community you are a part of, um, there will be conflict. Conflict is absolutely inevitable. Um, but what sort of practices, what sort of response we have to those are not inevitable. Um, so if we have a connection circle process, if we have some conversation processes established, when something does happen, then we can quickly fall back on those. So the restorative justice versus restorative practices is simply one way of saying, Restorative practices really wants to be sort of establishing a culture, establishing a climate um, in, in, in lieu of or in, uh, in despite of the fact that we will have instances, whereas restorative justice has typically just been in response to a crime, uh, criminal act. Um, yeah, that's all I want to like to say about that. Layla, is there anything you want to say more? Yeah, I really just want to connect it to the school to prison pipeline. And so we really like to situate our work in dismantling the school to prison pipeline. And so therefore, we really like to kind of point out the, the differences between restorative practices and restorative justice. And so really um, taking ownership of the schools being a justice system off the table and saying that we are going to do these practices, we're going to um, repair harm when harm is done, and we're really going to help kids learn um, and understand their reactions and understand their behavior and think through the ways in which they communicate with um, the larger community. And so we really do want to kind of always be thinking um, in our, in our training and when we do go out to schools and provide technical assistance, um, how does this connect to the school to prison pipeline? How are kids, uh, students of color, students with disability um, impacted um, with suspension? And so really beginning to do some of that work to, to dismantle that system um, and create new policies and create new approaches in the schools. So for this one, I really like to, um, I always like to start off our trainings by situating it with us, with the student that we've worked with. And so really I want you to think back to a time when you had a student in your life that had challenging behaviors. So this could either be uh, a student in your own classroom. This could be a student in your personal life. This could be your own child. Um, and so really just think back, how did you feel uh, were you angry at the student? Were you disappointed in how others treated the student? Um, thinking how that student was treated through these processes. And then I really want you to just keep that in mind for the remainder of this presentation. So at the end, we'll go back and reflect on what we learned and how this connects to the kiddos that we work with on a regular basis. And so really just holding that kid near your heart, reflecting with an open mind and an open heart to really think about um, how that kid might have been supported or might have been negatively impacted with the processes that the school set up. Another thing that we like to do in the beginning of a training is to remind folks that we often think of behavior or that our students are coming in uh, with a ready-made set of behavioral expectations that match or mirror our own. Um, and this is sort of a helpful slide in, in reminding us about that. So I'll just simply read the slide um, and Layla will say a little bit more here. So food for thought here. If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. And if a child doesn't know how to behave, do we teach? Do we punish? 
Do we go off on our soapbox and lecture to them about positive and negative influences and behavior? Do we teach them about learning how to deal with conflict and dealing with difficult people as part of what we do in life and how we have to deal with it on a regular basis? So just think in terms of what sort of ways we are showing students uh, are making behavior something that is learnable, that is something that is a little bit more teachable. And so really thinking about everything of those teachable moments, um, remembering that as educators, um, we want to be remembered by our students as the person who taught them how to deal with really challenging issues. Um, and these are sometimes the most challenging issues that they've ever faced in their life. This could be the most difficult time in their life. Um, and so really teaching them how to handle, um, how to self-regulate, how to understand, and teaching them some of those coping mechanisms. Um, because we all know that behavior is a form of communication. And many times students are, they are simply, they are communicating their need for connection. They're communicating their need to be comforted um, and they're asking for community. And so do we want to be remembered as the adult that punished or the adult that supported? So as we're introducing the idea of restorative practices, it's uh, one of the things that I want to make sure is very clear is that we don't have a necess we don't have an, a ready-made program that we sort of hand over to schools and say, "Here you go. Um, here's how you become a restorative practice school in three easy steps." It really is a complete paradigm shift from our traditional rule-based punitive discipline system. Um, as I talked about earlier with that distinction between restorative justice and restorative practices, in a lot of ways, our schools have adopted a criminal justice mindset when it comes to behaviors um, and discipline within schools, which simply means when you have a crime, you do the time. And we try to balance that out. We try to be fair. Uh, and we want the student to understand that if you are going to enact this sort of act, um, these are the uh, punishments that we are going to enact as a way to deter you from future uh, problems, behaviors, issues. And I really I want to emphasize that there are few people uh, within the educational system, within the criminal justice system that would say these are really working well. Um, and we need, we know that we need some sort of change. We need to understand behavior in a different way. And that's restorative practices, I feel like is one way that we're really attempting to understand that all of this is communication. All of this is a form of a, a way of, of students uh, expressing something. And if we can help them understand that, give them some different tools, then we really will change our entire discipline system. Um, so really seeing it just, just as, as, as a different process altogether, rather than it being sort of a crime and a response, it's more of like an incident happens and how does that student make things right? How do we repair this community? How do we repair each other? How do we repair this relationship um, and build some of those skills for future success? Right. And so restorative practices really allows for that shift, right? It invites all parties to heal, to learn, and to better understand one another. And so really taking that cultural recipro culturally reciprocal lens um, where we're, we're taking the time to better understand and to really delve a little bit deeper with our students and with ourselves, right? And so, so adding in vulnerability to our own leadership so that our kids can see us modeling that and then also learn from that. And so it really is about finding that, um, it's about evening the playing field, really. It's about finding that common ground with our students. So from a, from a systems perspective, I really like to, I like this visual because it really does tie in everyone who's impacted by a school climate. And so we have families, students, staff, the district, and then our community partners. And those can all create a healthy or an unhealthy school climate. And so restorative practices really helps us to develop those systems and those procedures that invite and encourage curiosity, empathy, respect, trust, honesty, compassion, accountability, inclusion, and collaboration. And with those practices, then we really, what we do is we train communities on how to build that community, how to address conflict and how to repair harm. 
There are five core values to restorative practices. These are listed as an R's simply as a way to remember them a little bit better. I like to say that core values of restorative practices are really these tools, uh, ideals, goals that we keep in sort of our back pocket whenever we are doing restorative practices of any form. Because we could do a mediation, we could do a connection circle, we could even have a conversation um, and be just as punitive, just as uh, harsh as we would be uh, with our regular, uh, our current punitive-based system, discipline system. So these values help remind us what sort of values are we taking into the practice that we are doing. Um, so I'll read over these um, and give a little bit of information, but I wanna start first and foremost with relationships. Relationship, relationship, relationship. I just, I can't emphasize that enough. This is the core value uh, at the heart of restorative practices. We are in relationship with each other. Teachers often understand that they're in relationship with their students. That seems like a very obvious one. They understand they need to build community. They understand they need to build relationships with their students, but they don't often see then that relationships that are happening outside of there. So they're with their coworkers. Um, with their administration, with the families that are supporting the students that are there, and then also the community that is a part of that school as well. So based in that one, we have our, res our relationships, but then we also have respect as an important component to all of this. How are we showing respect in the way that we're talking? How are we showing respect in the way that we're addressing harm? Um, and how are we helping the students learn respect uh, when something does happen. So that brings us back into the repair and responsibility uh, values. We're allowing students the opportunity to take responsibility for behaviors, for instances that happen within a school and work at repairing those harms. We talk about the language of how to make things right. Uh, and that makes a very open-ended scenario because you don't necessarily know how things are gonna be made right. Um, you can't sort of dictate that to a student. But we, we, we demonstrate that, we show them how we're repairing um, we take responsibility for our own actions. We allow students the opportunity. Um, and when something does happen, we look at it in that, in that paradigm shift. We really shift our mindset to say, when this has happened, this is not sort of an immediate reaction. I've got to uh, meet force with force is to understand a little bit and figure out what do we, how do we make things right here with repair and taking responsibility. The reintegration one is a little more open because a lot of our students are coming in and out of our classrooms um, for various reasons, health reasons, for disciplinary reasons. How are we reintegrating them back into our community? How are we making reintegration a key component to the makeup of our community? Um, and, you know, we often talk about students coming back in and how, it, you know, things were better when they were gone. Um, but what, what sort of dynamic is there and how is that student coming back in and how are we welcoming them back in? So those four, those five values really are sort of the core of all the things that we practice. Um, and I am, I'm convinced that even if you would take into your uh, current punitive systems these values, it would look very, very different. But they're a really helpful reminder um, as we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we do um, within our school district. So I'm going to introduce the social discipline window. And I really like this visual just because this helps me to become an um, just to really become a reflexive practitioner and continue to remind myself that I'm a lifelong learner. And so on any given day, I could be in any one of these quadrants, right? And so um, we do shift. Um, the real sweet spot is with restorative. And so I'll just go through each one of the quadrants and explain a little bit about what this means. So in the punitive quadrant, we have high control. So we almost have too many rules, right? But then we have low support. So there's no support happening for our kiddos. And so it really leaves students who might need extra accommodations um, out of gaining any of those skills that will help them regulate themselves. And so um, with that punitive, we, we have too many rules, but not enough support. In the neglectful quadrant, there's no rules and there are no supports. So this is our really, really relaxed staff, right? This is where I was when I first started to teach. Um, I, I didn't have any kind of system set up in my classroom and I didn't really have any kind of rules. And so therefore I was really, really being neglectful with my students. You know, I wanted to be the quote unquote cool teacher um, but without having that balance in my classroom, what I was doing was really doing more harm, right? Because I was, I was neglecting my students' needs. 
Um, so on to the next one. So for permissive, it's when we have low control, but we have high support. So these are our educators who really, really want to help students, right? Almost to the point where they might have a savior complex. I've often been here too, right? Where, where I'll just, I'll do things for my students. They ask me a question, I immediately answer, right? I'm not helping them to learn how to solve issues on their own. Um, you know, I've been this way in my career where I so badly just want to help that student. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm not setting up those high expectations for them as learners. Um, and so therefore they're not able to succeed on their own. And so, so when we aren't there to support our students and walk alongside them, we're setting them up for failure. And so that's what's meant with the permissive quadrant. Lastly is that sweet spot that I talked about. That's the, the restorative quadrant. And so that's where we have really high control, but we also have high support. And so what this means is that we have systems of accountability for our students. There are, um, we have solid classroom management. We have rules in our classroom that have been developed by the class. So we're working with our students to develop what those rules are. Um, and then if they don't have the skills, we're offering ongoing supports to teach them those skills and help them understand. And so this is where we, we are constantly doing connection circles. We're engaging in dialogue with our students. We're really setting up that community in the classroom. And so that sweet spot is where we want you to be. And so as we continue through this, I want you to just continue to think about your own practices uh, as an educator and, and where you fall in. Um, I could name any single student in any one of these quadrants that I've worked with in the past um, and, and tell a story about how I might have been too punitive, or I might have been neglectful, or I might have been overly permissive. Um, but really the point of this is to become a very reflexive practitioner and reminding yourself that you're a lifelong learner. And then also through that, we're teaching our kids to be lifelong learners, right? This is where, where when we make mistakes, we admit it and, and we apologize publicly and we, we, we tell our students, hey, I might have messed up, but I'm a lifelong learner. And that helps you get to that restorative spot in your classroom. So this next slide just illustrates again how we're looking at our traditional punitive-based system versus a restorative practice. So when we go back to that paradigm shift uh, slide that we had talked about earlier, about really looking at things differently. Um, this slide helps illustrate that in a really direct and meaningful way. So I'll just talk about a few of these. So first one, student violates a school and rules. So this is our traditional practice, right? Uh, kid comes in with a hoodie on, or kid comes in um, eating food in our classroom. All right, that's a rule, you violated that rule, here is your consequence. In restorative practices, we're gonna violate people and relationships. So when we're gonna see that exact same instance, when we see a kid who has um, come in with their hoodie, um, we're going to be inquisitive. We're going to be in, uh, curious. What's going on? How are you feeling today? Let's do a quick check-in. Um, just a different response altogether rather than making it sort of a quick knee-jerk reaction response to rule broken, here's your response. Um, because we're not seeing that as a, as a way that ch kids are really changing behavior. Um, it gets more uh, kids punished. It gets more people in the office, um, but it's not really a long-term effect. The, in a traditional, we look at ju ju justice as establishing guilt. Who's, who's responsible for this? Um, and who, what are you going to do to, to, to uh, uh, be vindicated by this? But in a restorative practice, justice really identifies needs and obligations. And this is going back to that phrase, how do we make things right? And oftentimes in restorative practices, making things right isn't just put on the hands or the head of one student. Um, it really becomes a bit more of a, of a dialogue or of a conversation. The other one, accountability is punishment. Um, you are punished, that demonstrates that you're now accountable. With restorative practices, accountability means that you're gonna understand the impact and you're gonna work at repairing harm. So you can just see there's a real paradigm shift between all of these. Um, so I'll give you a second, just as we talk through a little bit of these, um, go through and look at some of these and then think of those instances where you can think of a student who has violated something, uh, a rule or a policy and what sort of reaction or response the school had. 
or think about how teachers um, are sometimes violating these and what sort of responses or reactions the students had or administration had to those. Um, so we'll just keep moving on here as we go on. Is there anything more you would want to say to this, Layla? I really just want to add on that with restorative practices, that it really is a um, community involved approach, right? And so it really, I think that that's one of the most important things is that we're making sure that we involve multiple parties when things go wrong, right? And so um, we're really providing those wraparound supports for students. Um, whether it's the quote unquote offender or the victim. And so how do we make sure that we support all parties involved? So typically oh. in, oh, go ahead, Layla. No, go ahead. Yeah, typically in our, in our conversation, if we were doing this in a, in a room, we would have you do a kind of a share and thinking about that student whose name you had written down. And write down, uh, have a conversation with two or the three of the folks that are next to you. So if you're doing this on your own and you still have that student in your head right now, um, just think a little bit about, think about a time when you were with that student and you were any of those uh, things in that, the, the, the quadrant there. You were punitive with that student. You were neglectful with that student, permissive, or maybe even restorative. And again, I, I really appreciate Layla's honesty here that we are all of those things um, uh, at some point with our students, um, with others, with those that we love um, and those that we hate. Um, we tend to uh, move around and uh, within those quadrants. These are not set in stone sort of reactions, responses. They really are um, situational. And what we're hoping with restorative practices and as we're learning more about doing these, we're trying to embody a lot of these, is to say when we are punitive or we are neglectful or we are permissive, we're gonna recognize that, um, give ourselves a little bit of grace and then really attempt the next time to say, okay, I messed it up this time, but I've got two or three more times I'm gonna, I'm gonna work at this um, and try to make a little bit more of a restorative. Is there anything more you would wanna say to this, Layla? No, oh, and I really think that it's just so important that we, we talk about this as a school community, right? And so, so beginning that language um, where we are always bringing up these four different quadrants as a staff um, and being able to go to a co-teacher and really saying like, oh, I was really punitive with this kid, right? Or I was really neglectful with this kid this morning. Um, and just being able to have those safe spots within the staff body at the school um, that you can talk to and you can digest these together is so important. And that's what really makes us reflective practitioners. Um, and that is what ultimately will make us better educators or better principals or better EAs or whatever our role might be at the school. It helps us hone in on our practices when we have that kind of community where we can, we can talk through these things um, with, with a buddy teacher or or with a group of um, you know, other folks that are in the same role. And so I just encourage you to really, um, as you continue to listen to our different videos and learn more, to really find that person at your school that you can engage in these conversations with, just so that it helps, that it helps your own growth. So now we're gonna move into what sort of practices that we're doing here um, within APS uh, and talk a little bit through each of these. And so um, each of us will kind of offer our thoughts on, on these, but I wanna really um, emphasize that these are the ways that we're um, expressing restorative practices within our community. It may look different in other communities and in every school that we have worked with, um, they're connecting with some of these and not all of these, but these are really some of the, the kind of the nuts and bolts. This is how we're implementing uh, the core values, we're implementing what we're seeing as, as, as a social uh, process, uh, building a school climate within, a, within a, a school itself. So that tier one system, as we're looking at the, the top there, we're talking about connection circles and restorative conversations. Connection circles, when, when we're introducing uh, restorative practices to a school, we typically are gonna be talking to the staff. We're gonna talk to teachers, all staff members, administration. Um, and letting them know what are connection circles, how they can be implemented within classrooms. 
but then also how are they implementing them within each other? How are they doing staff meetings in a circle process? Um, how are they having uh, uh, grade level meetings uh, in, with connection circles? Understanding, recognizing that the connection circle process is a really deliberate conversation where we're sitting in a circle. We typically have a talking piece. We have some form of way to regulate and modulate that conversation. We have questions that are very open-ended, but guided to help us reflect a little bit more. Um, and we're having somebody who's helping facilitate that conversation. Um, and in an ideal world, we're gonna have kids um, leading those connection circles in a classroom, helping their peers talk about processes, talk about the community itself and what they wanna do to sort of uh, see improvement, uh, work through things, or even talk through things. The second level, restorative conversations, these are really one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, traditionally, this has been a conversation between a student and a staff person uh, about an incident that has happened, about something that's happened within the classroom or something that's ongoing. Uh, we have a really guided process for that that slows that conversation down, makes it very intentional, but also makes it extremely uh, communicative both ways. Uh, traditional conversations that teachers are having with students are pretty one way. Um, the teacher is talking and they want compliance from the student. In our version, um, you're getting feedback from both. You're, in, you're introducing some positive ideas. You're giving the students some opportunity to think about some positive things. And you're really not addressing the issue itself until we've worked through just connecting um, and building up some more positive things. Is there anything you want to say about those two practices, Layla? So really all I want to add is that those are our tier one practices and that's really about creating positive school climates, right? And so these are really our two practices that can be fully led by educators, by teachers in the classroom. Um, there are really creative ways that the school can action plan how to do weekly connection circles, how to have time and space to have ongoing restorative conversations with our students. Um, and so it really is all a part of that paradigm shift just to find the time, the resources and the space to carry out these two practices. But these two practices really do lead to creating a more positive climate in our schools. Then we're going to introduce some of the tier two. These are more reactions, responsive to instances that happen within our school. So problem solving circles, in my experience, have really been just modified connection circles. So typically in a classroom setting, there's going to be something that happens. If we've established connection circles as a regular practice, then when there is an in issue, an incident happens, um, say a, a, a uh, something happens with the substitute or um, something happens with students in the classroom. We can do a problem solving circle where we throw it back to the to the class and we say in a circle process, what happened? Let's diagnose the problem itself and then let's all come up with ideas uh, for how we're going to make this right. How are we going to resolve this? And then we're going to record that and we're going to hold each other accountable to that process. Um, so it, it looks similar, but it's a very different process. But again, throwing back that ownership to everybody to help figure out what we what needs to happen in order to make things right. The other one, restorative agreement meetings. Um, this is when uh, we've had a number of conversations with students. Um, we've had a number of issues that have come up. Um, we've had we've had attempts at making uh, doing things restoratively over and over again, and it's things are just not really settling setting in. And so we need to have an agreement uh, with that student. But in this agreement, we're Traditionally, that has been um, administration meeting with the student and having an uh, agreement that they write up and then having the student or the parent um, or, or the uh, whoever is, is in charge of that student uh, taking charge of, of that agreement, signing off on that agreement. In a restorative agreement, we're going to have a dialogue and we're going to be just as restorative in that conversation as we would be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we're going to let them come up with some of those agreements. We're going to let them come up with some of the solutions. Um, and we're going to let them under come up with some of the consequences that they are going to agree to if, if they're not following through with this. What, do, what are our expectations? And if we fall short of our expectations, what do you think is a reasonable experience? Um, and I know, Layla, you've had a little bit more experience with restorative agreement uh, meetings than I have. What, what's been some of your experiences with that? Yeah. Um, and so one thing that I really like to bring up with the with both problem solving circles and restorative agreement meetings is that they're really democratic processes. Right. And so we're allowing our kiddos 
to, to take some ownership of their behavior and then come up and we're, we're empowering them to come up with a plan about how they're going to fix it, right? And so if we're just forcing kids into compliance, so if we're just saying that we're doing a problem solving circle, but then we're not really listening to what the, what the kids are telling us, um, that's not really a restorative practice, right? That's just doing a circle. And so we really, I really like to emphasize that it's about getting the, the the student voice in these practices. And so when things do go wrong, okay, we're gonna come together as a community and we're gonna solve this in a problem solving circle. Um, or when there is conflict between two parties, we're gonna come up and we're gonna like, yeah, now it's a little bit more formalized. Um, this is a visual reminder to you, it's on paper. Um, but it really is about, okay, how are we going to both improve this? Um, and so in both of these, it really is the adults serving as models. Um, and so I really just continue to emphasize the importance of allowing students to, to, to be in a space where they, they feel comfortable to talk and um, not be punished for it. Um, so when we are doing these practices, when we're having a problem solving circle, we really, really need to be just cautious about um, making sure that we are taking what they say and um, making sure that their, their, their needs are being met. And our final uh, tier three, these are when um, we have a little bit more severe instances. Um, restorative mediation and community group conferences make up this tier. Restorative mediation is something that is known by our schools. We, a lot of our counselors within APS are doing mediations. Um, and what we're teaching is a bit more of a restorative model for mediations. And so we're talking about uh, doing an, in, uh, an intake with the kids where we're attempting as best as we can to have a, a restorative language. We wanna be inquisitive. We wanna find out a little bit more what happened. And we also wanna have that student come up with some ideas about how they can make things right. In my experience, if you do the intake process well, uh, that covers about 75% of the actual mediation itself. Because then when you have those parties together and they've already worked through the issue, they've talked with each other, you've, you've heard them, they've felt heard, they've worked through understandings of responses and what obligations and, uh, they need to do to repair the harm. Uh, then it's a very, it's a simple conversation um, or it's a much easier conversation. And then really you uh, document that information, help them understand, write that agreement out. Um, and then you're following up again with them in a, in a couple days or a week to say, how have things worked out? Um, do we need to re, re, regroup on this one? Do we need to look at the agreement that we came up with? Um, or are things going fairly well? Um, and in my experience, the vast majority of mediations um, have very, very positive outcomes. And kids are able to come up with ideas and agreements on their own um, and flourish because of that. And so it's been a process that I really love. Um, I enjoy teaching it. I enjoy doing it. Um, and I'm hoping that more and more schools allow other, other than counselors to have that experience with their students, to have that experience with other staff members even, um, and doing their own peer mediations. Because when folks are, are, are allowed the opportunity to sort of face the conflict head, to, head, head on, rather than doing the normal thing in our community, in our school culture, which is the workaround, you avoid that person, you don't talk to them, or you talk a, a above them to get them in trouble, um, when you meet them face to face, you find out a very different, uh, you have a very different understanding of the of the harm that's been caused and how it needs to be repaired. In community group conferences, this is going to go back to a similar format to what we saw with um, problem solving circles and connection circles. But in a conference, it's a really guided conversation. We have a specific script that we follow, um, that we've been trained in, that we help uh, people go through. Um, and particularly in these, this is going to be a fairly large incident. This is going to be something that has had um, significant ripple effects within a school community. And so we're going to invite a lot of people to be a part of this, including those who were the most directly affected by it, um, some of the support person advocates for them, uh, maybe a community member or two. Um, if you had a resource officer who was in involved in this, they're going to be invited to that. Family members are going to be invited. Um, and then there's going to be two uh, two. Uh, facilitators for this. Um, and we're going to talk about the incident, we're going to talk about the harms that are caused, and we're going to come together and figure out a solution for that. Is there anything more you would want to add to that, Layla? 
Um, just really the tier three is really about our alternative approaches to suspension or um, other things that continue to lead kiddos down the school to prison pipeline. So just returning back to, and I'll, I'll always say this, what we are trying to do is dismantle the school to prison pipeline here in our school district. And so it's really important to start to think through these ways that we are handling things in a restorative manner. Again, to take it back to how do we help our kids learn? Um, how do we turn this into a teachable moment for our students and even for our staff? Because adults still have a lot of learning to do. And so through the mediation and through the community group conferences, we really are trying to come up with some more creative solutions for when things really go wrong. Um, I just want to continue to emphasize that with the community group conference, there really is that strong emphasis on community. Um, and so not only are we just bringing people that might have been harmed, but we're also bringing those advocates to the table. And so really providing the, the student the time to think about who they want to bring to the table, um, who the victim needs at the table to support them. And um, so really allowing that opportunity. I've seen community group conferences um, be held for everything from property destruction um, out in the neighborhood um, to things that have gone wrong with neighboring schools and we brought the two schools together. Um, and so they really are, they're large, they take a lot of time, but done correctly, I have just seen such positive impacts to the larger community. So why do we do this and who benefits? Um, and so really, we just wanted to kind of um, begin to wrap up this presentation with what are our anticipated outcomes when we do this work? And so when we do this work, we see a reduction in detention in in-school and out-of-school suspension in our long-term suspensions. So those long-term suspensions are essentially, um, those are ex expulsions, right? They, we see a reduction in our referrals to criminal justice. We see reduction in uh, chronic absenteeism and reduction in bullying. Um, and what we see increases in is grade point average, in school safety, in how teachers are feeling supported. Because when we're creating these healthy school climates, we're offering support to our teachers and to other staff. And so it really is increasing the overall mental health of our staff and our students. So really the benefits outweigh the cost. And so just to wrap up, it, it really just want you to think back to the beginning of this presentation, the kiddo that we talked about, the kiddo that we were placing close to our heart, um, and, and just remember that student, remember what that student went through, and think about what might have been done differently for that student. Or if things were handled in a restorative manner, what what positively impacted that kiddo? How did we support that kiddo? And so really just continuing to think, um, how do we make sure that we are that positive role model for our students and that we're remembered? Again, we're remembered as those teachers that supported them in their time of need. And I also just wanna end with thinking about those times when we did do it right and celebrating those times when we did have that conversation with that kid um, or when somebody did have that with us and what sort of impact that had on us. I know so many educators who have that one person who took the time, who engaged with them, who connected with them and what a significant impact that had on their lives. So think about those as well. Think about the time that you uh, were impacted positively by an educator, by an adult, by somebody else, a peer um, and what sort of things you can do as well. So. I really appreciate um, getting getting that time just to sort of pause and think a little bit here. So this is our contact information. So we do have a Google website for the school climate team where you can find out more information. I encourage you to go and look, um, look up our website. 
We have a lot of amazing videos and resources that you can utilize for your school. And then we have all of our contact information. So again, my name is Layla D. Heyman. I'm the director of my office. My cell phone and my email is listed there. And I'm Jeff Newcomer Miller. Uh, I'm the restorative practice coordinator. And again, office uh, or my cell phone number or my email address. Um, we respond to all of those. We try to be uh, as communicative as we can, um, even uh, even when we're out of school. Uh, this is important stuff to both of us, um, and we really want to see more and more of our schools sort of adopt a lot of this that we're, that uh, we think is is crucial to the benefit of our entire district itself. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today.